Hi again. And just to wrap up the series on knife training books, um, I just want to give you a few thoughts on um, how you train, why, and a little look at my own uh, training uh, path in uh, the use of the knife. And first of all, uh, there are many other books and uh, more recently DVDs that are of value. I haven't read them all, I haven't reviewed them all. So, um, you know, don't necessarily limit yourself to the ones that I've reviewed. But even more important than that is to have um, training under, under somebody who is um, who, who really knows uh, the reality of the knife. Uh, in the United States, people like Nick Hughes, James Keating, they're the people I, I would uh, probably seek out um, for, for knife training. So, um, with my background in the traditional martial arts, uh, primarily karate, um, really, it's not a, it's not an edge weapon system, and uh, it doesn't translate over to the use of the knife. So, really, my first uh, training influence was Gary Spires. You know, Gary had worked as a slaughterman butcher back in Australia. And so he spent his whole working day cutting flesh and uh, he was very adept at it. And, uh, you know, if you ask Gary about knives, he used to just recommend um, butcher's knives, um, your, your ordinary meat knives, steak knives, because they're designed to cut flesh. And uh, as I say, he was very adept with a knife. And he told me a story from when he was training in, um, in, at the Gojukai in um, Tokyo. They had this uh, kick bag and one of his seniors came in one day and Gary was practicing with a, with a, a wooden tanto and he, he was practicing um, doing um, patterns on the uh, kick bag and this, the uh, senior berated him for this. And in my naivety at the time, I said to Gary, well, why were you doing that? He, he said, well, that's how you train, Digger. You know, you, you've got to train on real targets. And it seemed very obvious now, and we do that. But back then, it was a light bulb. It was a revelation. Um, Gary had a technique, a way of attacking with the knife, which he passed on to me. And I, I, I teach on some of the courses. I've taught it, taught it a few times. And it's really a showstopper. Um, there's, there's two attacks I teach that are, are, are fairly... Um, I keep them fairly close hold and just teach them um, um, on, on um, certain courses. One's Gary's attack and the other is an attack um, that a, a Yakuza used in, in Tokyo in a fight. Um, the next influence was when I was in Japan, uh, Terry and I um, met Don Drago uh, several times, but we went up to uh, Chiba and... Um, where he was living at the time and he arranged for a demonstration of all the traditional uh, sword, EI, EI jitsu and stuff like that. But one of the things he did, he showed us some um, films he'd taken in uh, Southeast Asia of the different uh, indigenous uh, arts there. And some of them were of knife, the use of the knife. And he, he showed us this guy and he said, how would you cope with that attack? It was just so fast and, and, and so aggressive and so terrifying and, and so fluid. And uh, a term that Kelly McCann uses is that when you're facing that type of attack, you're standing in a blender. And it was really impressive and it, it kind of stayed with me. Um, then <clears throat> after I stopped teaching Goju, uh, it freed me to... Um, do some training of my own and I, I went into Filipino martial arts and one of the guys in the class was actually a guy who trained with me he'd been a second down under me in Goju Paul Hennigan and Paul was a very talented martial arts guy his background he'd done many other things before he came to us and he always had very very nice techniques very very nice form 
and a very um, fast brain for learning. And after the class, he would show me stuff. And I picked up probably more from Paul than I did in the actual class. Showed me the drills and the flow drills and the carenzas and so on. I, I really got into that. And then it was Marcus with his background in Filipino martial arts and, um, you, you know, his, his Filipino heritage, uh, a tremendous skill set in, in the knife systems. Um, we did quite a bit of training together. And when I was in Minneapolis, we'd go, go to um, Rick Fay's place. And um, he said, you don't need to learn that many flow drills and that many of the drills. Um, you, you get a baseline and from then on, it's kind of installed within you. And I was still mad on learning all this stuff, but I, I, I came to realize that he's, he's, he's right. And I really slimmed down the syllabus and don't teach many, many drills, just enough to get that necessary uh, uh, agility and um, the ability to, oh, it, what I've mentioned before, the recursive system, that there's always a next move to make with the knife. Um, I was then fortunate to train with Bob Casper when he came over to the UK, did one course with him, and he was very influential. Um, also, <clears throat> I've got to mention Nick Hughes. And Nick Hughes is very proficient with all weapons, um, particularly the traditional martial arts weapons. He, he's really a master with them, but um, he's very adept with the knife and he did a lot of knife stuff when he was in the Foreign Legion. And um, we were on a course together in the United States and um, we were both invited up into the suite where the uh, training team were staying and uh, we'd spend many hours up there with them exchanging techniques. And these were the guys who um, were training the tier one units and things like that in, in and they had these techniques for sentry elimination. And they, they showed us it and they asked Nick about it and Nick showed them his techniques and they were far superior to what these guys were teaching. Um, it really was. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't think that their method of sentry elimination, although it's not my field, but just as um, as an interested observer, was um, particularly efficient. Whereas Nick stuff was, and they were really impressed with Nick, and and they kind of hanging on his every word. Um, Camp get tough over in Sweden with um, Mika. We really went into the World War Two knife stuff there and that, that was a really good insight and um, so all, all this <clears throat> kind of contributed to how um, I, I train with the knife how I teach the knife and all, all the training materials are reviewed they've all had an influence on me in, in some way the point of all this is that one of the things I always say is the knife is a very very easy weapon to use so you've got 14 year old kids running around using knives, stabbing people. It's very easy to do. However, the defensive use of the knife is very difficult. It's accessing a knife under stress from its carriage position and being able to use it. That's a, a, an order of difficulty far in advance of having the knife in your hand in a hidden position, talking your way close enough, grabbing the guy and then stabbing him. Uh, it's two different things completely. The offensive use of the knife and the defensive use of the knife. So I've concentrated mainly on the defensive use of the knife. And that's where the training is essential. You've got to have a system. The carriage method, etc. has got to fit in with your um, lifestyle. You've got to have uh, appropriate training, sufficient training and realistic training, particularly scenario work. Um, when you're actually being aggressed and can you get the weapon into action. So they're, they're the areas that, um, that I think are important. Then um, the other thing is the decision to carry a knife. It's a completely personal decision. I never try to persuade people one way or the other. Um, 
However, in my view, knives are tools. Man is a tool bearing animal. Um, our evolution means that we use tools to um, control the environment and uh, uh, get us out of situations and a knife is a tool. And uh, if, if you want to use it appropriately, then that's what all the training is about. Um, I know lots of very responsible people with good jobs who are family people who carry both a firearm and a knife. And uh, they've made a decision and um, their own self-protection and the protection of others has a high priority with them. But if that's not for you, it's um, understandable. You can't be half-hearted about it. Um, one of the worst things you can do is carry a weapon and, and hope that it magically will help you in, in the event of a, a violent confrontation, whereas you haven't done the training, you haven't thought about it, and you haven't addressed the other issue, which is the legalities. And the legalities, obviously, are very, very important. The, the laws in the place that you uh, live, and I always advise people, follow the law, don't break the law. Uh, I do, I follow the law. In the UK, carriage of offensive weapons is illegal. I don't carry an offensive weapon. Now, there are a range of knives which are what's called UK legal. This is one of them. It's a Berka. Um, it's one of the more inexpensive knives, Spyderco Dua version. The reason it's legal in the UK is blade length and also the fact that it doesn't lock. It's not a locking knife. It is um, a, a pen knife, just, just a folder. Um, but it, there's enough friction that it, it is um, quite secure in place. But by wrapping your finger on the choil, um, the blade can't close. It is legal for the UK. However, I've never carried it outside the house. And the reason being is that um, having to argue the legalities with a police officer who's stopped and searched you, um, you're going to the police station and the desk sergeant will probably uh, accept a charge against you. <clears throat> I've, I, I know police officers who carry um, uh, legal UK legal, legal knives, and they've shown them to the colleagues, and the colleagues said, I'd lock you up with that. So um, I don't want to go through that hassle. Uh, I, I bought one of them just to try it out and to show guys on courses and so on, but um, that's my personal decision. I don't break the the law even though it, it is legal uh, the thing is in this day and age you the use of deadly force uh is is very controversial police officers we see this in the united states who use deadly force in very reasonable situations and some of them are, are um, caught on video uh, are pilloried uh, you've got district attorneys who are anti-police and they are charging police officers you imagine what it's like for civilians okay if you use deadly force as a civilian uh you're in a world of trouble it's it's you know what i i say to people uh over in the united states worst thing that can happen to you is you get shot second worst thing is you shoot someone it's even worse with a knife okay the the image the optics of it um the revulsion against knives the cultural um, uh, um, conceptions of a knife, uh, you know, the, the UK and mostly America is not really a knife culture, although there are knife cultures within it. Um, it's abhorrent to most people, no matter how justified you are. You can be 100% justified and um, you're still going to have legal, legal problems. So that's why I would say, um, you know, it's a very personal decision. One area I do do want to address is, is for women. For women's self-protection, uh, a knife does, a, a weapon, a firearm, but a knife also um, bec becomes um, something of an equaliser. Um, because uh, something like this, steel can make up for the testosterone deficit and um, this knife which is the harpy 
uh, a noted female martial arts instructor, Gracielle Casillas, she designed a knife called the Lady Hawk, which is basically that and more expensive version of that. And the idea is the way women know, naturally without any training kind of strike like this, and I've seen lots of girl fights, they do this kind of cycling, cat striking. Do that with a knife in your hand and you, you're giving the person problems. So I, I do like this this knife for, uh, or a knife for women, particularly this one. This is um, uh, a Mike Sastre sheet, which I, I find very, very good. And of course, the other knife is the Hideaway, uh, designed by a woman, basically. And uh, lots of uh, accessories to carry it in various ways, including clipping it to your bra and so on. I recommend it for guys as well. It's a good, it's, um, you, you get a secure grip. Uh, even if you're, you're knocked down and on the ground, it, the knife won't be dislodged from your hand. You can recover and uh, use it again. And uh, it's a very short blade, but it, it's sharp, it's effective. And uh, as I say, lots of carry options. So that's um, basically what I would uh, just sum up the whole thing. The legalities, uh, again, training, scenario training makes you perform under the parameters, the rules of engagement and so on. And if you've got a coach who understands all this, he, he will he, he will set it up so that you, you're, ideally you, you will react with when the force is necessary. And you what you won't overreact or, or you you won't use excessive force, so you you're aware of the legal ramifications. Same applies with the firearm, obviously, but we're, we're talking about uh, knives at the moment. So this wraps up the series on uh, books on knife. I hope you found them interesting. Um, uh, the books are informative, and uh, you, you know we're going to continue with the next series of books from my bookshelf uh, straight after this. So enjoy.